The GZ Chop Shop Podcast is made possible by listeners like you and our Patreon supporters like Anna G and Sailor Lion. Coming up on the show, Ubisoft raises the price of their AAA game titles, Disney goes full Marvel at D23, and what anime made our picks of the week. This and more, coming up. It's time for the GZ Chop Shop Podcast. Each week, hosts Project Itachi and War Nurse bring you the latest in the gaming and tech industry. From the hottest releases to the juiciest scoops, while breaking down all the things you wish you knew. Now kick back, relax, and prepare to have your mind blown. The GZ Chop Shop starts right now. Welcome back, everybody, to another week of the GZ Chop Shop. As always, we have an amazing episode lined up for you guys. I am your host, Project Itachi, joined by my good friend and co-host, War Nurse. And we've got... Let, let, let's just take the gloves off here. We've got something we've been talking about probably for the last year on the show. And in recent weeks, we've been talking about how we've made predictions. And it's just uncanny how many of these things come to fruition and one thing that came across and actually it was it was you who who put it in our in our discord which by the way guys make sure to check out our discord server we actually put all of the news that we get in there so if you guys ever want to read these articles or get an idea of what we're going to talk about in the next episode check out our discord i'll put a link in the description um ubisoft getting right into it is raising the price of their triple a titles to seventy dollars now i want you guys to think about this every gamer knows that probably for the last i want to say almost almost 10 years games have been dabbling between the 50 and 60 dollar mark with probably in the last two years especially since covid with activision now i want to put out there ubisoft is not doing anything that wasn't already done but they are just the ones who've been ballsy enough to just say, no, we're going to make this the norm because Activision and Blizzard have, they, they pushed it with call of duty. Their last call of duty was, I want to say in the $70 margin range. Um, they dabbled with it a little bit and everyone just kind of rolled with it because all the call of duties come out with different versions, et cetera, et cetera. No one bats an eye. There's the different legendaries and, and super, come with all these pack versions so everyone's like oh yeah a hundred dollars that's justifiable for the extra uh downloadable content that makes me look better than the guy who spent only sixty dollars um but ubisoft is saying you know what nah we think our games are worth seventy dollars and i recently put out a tweet i said if ubisoft wants me to pay seventy dollars for one of their games that game better come with a whole strategy guide hardcover or be a completed, I mean, a hundred percent completed game, because I don't want to see a $39 DLC price tag coming down the line later. Like I'm not paying you $70 for something incomplete. And then you charge me another $40 three months later for extra content that could have easily been put into the game on launch. Um, and, and, and seeing Ubisoft, Go forward and do this. I also think this is them being petty because remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, with Ubisoft saying, hey, or actually a couple of months, I think it was a couple of months ago, honestly, when they said, hey, we're going to make our old library no longer accessible. Yeah, that was early last month. Yeah. So they received backlash for that. And they've backpedaled on that decision because we were like, hold on, people pay for these games and then you're telling them they can't get it. So then they rolled that decision back, say, Hey, you know what? We're not going to do that. After all, you guys will still get to keep your games. And now a month later they're going, but we're going to charge you $70 for the game. And I'm like, that's, that's too my, You know, my, my, my guess is, they probably looked at what the average person spends on a game. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, like you said earlier, there's different tiers of a game when it comes out. 
um you have like the base game which typically runs about 50 dollars, give or take you know whether or not it's a triple a game sometimes it's a little less uh but about 50 bucks is what you're looking at um but most people would go for like the premium you know version of the game or the legendary version of the game and it would come off all the skins so they probably looked at the average purchases of all the gamers and they said okay 70 dollars uh, appears to be about the average here and that gave them the justification to raise it up because from their point of view, $70 is what we're, we are all willing to pretty much spend. I call bullshit because, you know, the, the fact is just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the lawsuits going around right now, mainly towards Sony regarding digital copies of a game and their prices versus the price of the hard copy. Um, yeah. and some of some of that backfired with the people suing and uh, other stuff's ongoing. Uh, some, some groups are trying to prove monopoly, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but you know, I had said that gamers are probably going to start coming after other companies and other developers. Um, I, st I still stand with that. I do still think that is going to be the case even more so now if we're talking about raising prices. Uh, I don't think Activision Blizzard, um, I don't think any of these other uh, companies are going to raise their prices to meet that yet. I think they're going to see what happens with this because typically what we see in the gaming industry, and this holds true for the most part, one company makes a move, a big move out of nowhere. The rest of them watch, and if it goes well, they follow suit. If it doesn't go well, they'll come up with their own version that's more of a compromise that seems like a good idea mm. or a, a, a better idea uh, from the gamer's point of view, and they kind of just capitalize on it. Yeah, It's just this constant, what are they doing? What, what, what is my competition doing? Okay, it worked, it didn't work, and then they just kind of like chess, all in order to get us to pay as much as possible. And I'm with you. What the fuck is a $70 game <laughs> at base going to come with, especially if I buy it digitally? Because they know most of us are. Well, mm -hmm. The numbers were something like what? Like s about 65, 70% of all consumers in the gaming industry purchase a digital uh, format yep. over the hard copy. And, you know, we, we see like with the PlayStation 5 that they're starting to dwindle down. The Switch doesn't even have a fucking disk drive. Oh, well, uh, they don't need I it. I think that... Right, but I think the new the new version, the Twitch 2 coming out, I heard rumors, I don't know if it's true, that it wouldn't come with one. I don't think that's going to be the case. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'm surprised Xbox didn't just ditch them all the way, but Sony kind of took the the lead there and for the most part ditched on the on the digital copy or on the, the hard copies, the discs. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But wow, $70 for a freaking game? yeah 70 dollars. yeah and, and and like like we were saying there's nothing even tangible i was actually talking with uh they're not know. losing money no no if anything they're not losing money they're making more money this? on doing less if you really think about it and the the way that a lot of, a lot of people will probably break it down and the and it's it's a valid argument because nobody who uh and and, and anyone listening if you work in the video game industry uh, please visit our website, osn-media.com. Uh, we have a guest request form. Please fill it out. We would love to speak to people in the industry. Give us some insight. Maybe we're missing something in this. I'd love um, to know what we're missing. Yes, because because I, I have a good idea what I'll be missing for seventy dollars for one game. Yeah, I <laughs> I told the guy, I was like seventy dollars. That's that's a that's a whole spa weekend in Thailand right there, bro. Seventy dollars just to get you like two sometimes three sometimes games, three games may yeah. maybe even a fourth if you bought like slightly older games just to kind of depending on what you're going with but jesus back man. in the heyday where used games actually were worth it and people took care of their games 70 dollars got you half of a shelf you could go into the store with 70 dollars and walk out with games for all of your consoles and still have some money left over to go see a movie i, I know because i've done it I, I remember buying, uh, I can't remember which it was. It was the last hard copy back in like 2009 or 10 of uh, World of Warcraft. It was 
whichever DLC came out about that time uh, or expansion, uh, excuse me. Uh, but I, I had the, it was 35. I remember it was th- about $35 and it came with a big ass box my, like most expansions before it did. And you got like all kinds of shit. You know, you could buy different types of boxes with more and more stuff, but they all came with stuff. Yeah. And that's the last time I remember uh, being able to buy a hard version of a game on top of the fact that it came with everything. And I think we can all agree. Wh- what the hell? They're trying to like double the prices of games in the past 10 years. Yeah. They're trying to take the collector get value less out. for it. And then you want to give us unfinished games. I just don't understand. <laughs> like, I'm with you. Like, like, can we, we get a professional sense. over here? Cause I, I need the math. Please give me them. You know, that fucking mean that's that teacher. And it's like the math, like that's me. I'm trying to figure out the math, yeah, trying right to figure here. out the numbers. Like, please give me the reason why, because don't sit here and tell me with a straight face that you, that you honestly believe it's because the games are getting more graphical um, or more work. Like, yes. Are the are the games more detailed? Are they more complex? Sure. But don't sit there and tell me that when there's the, the base game and then the like you you have tiers and all the way up to like hell some games have like two hundred dollar freaking DLC or not DLCs but uh, versions of that game and it's like a year's worth of like memberships and skins and shit. Uh, Jesus, like I just don't understand. So the way I think a lot of the way that they would probably present it to us is. Uh, server costs, server costs go up for the games. And then right now they're in the perfect position. Ubisoft is slick. They're in the perfect position to do this because across the board, we're dealing with inflation. So they can be like, hey, the price to make games went up on our end, which eh, I I don't know. Games are literally their own category. Um, But they could be like, oh, the price of inflation, we got to raise, we got, we got to raise the prices that it is what it is. And that's one thing. Then they'll say, you know, the, the, the developers, the programmers, their pay. What I think it is, is when it comes to games, it's half. It's not so much the games anymore. Back in the day, it was 90 percent the game, 10 percent the marketing. The game sold itself. The game sold by word of mouth. The game sold by having a legacy. The game sold by having a community. But because gaming has become so much more widespread, it's literally the number one most consumed media. It's now 90% marketing, 10% the game. So they're spending all this extra money on a marketing budget and then give us 10% of a game that then they milk for the next five to six years for more money. And... That's how you wind up with, uh, I hate to say it, I still have a a place within my heart for the game, but a perfect example of this is Destiny, Destiny 2. That game was supposed to literally just be one game, and then they broke it into two. And because we let it happen, and they do it slow, it's a slow burn. They do it and they convince us, well, this is the way it has to be, when it really doesn't. We've proven this before. When we speak up... I, I, I'm I'm curious what you think here. Do you think that you be, that this is partly due to Ubisoft trying to make up uh, lost revenue over the past few years? Because I don't know if a lot of people know this. Uh, let me let me pull a little list up here for you guys, okay? Uh, but basically, let's see here. Uh, top ten. Uh, most successful financially successful uh, companies Um, and the top three, or I'm sorry, the top four is Tencent, uh, Nintendo, Microsoft, Sony, and then uh, we got Activision on here as well. They're they're like in the top 10. Um, But on this list, I see a couple on here. I'm not really familiar with actually, Uh, but Ubisoft's not in the top 10. They actually used to be on the top 10 Mm. up until a few years ago. Um, and of course that was before all these huge buyouts that have been happening over the past four or five years, my, yeah. especially between uh, Microsoft and Sony. Uh, but Ubisoft used to be on that top 10 list uh, back in, I think the last time was like 14 or 15, something like that. Uh, but Ubisoft has been losing money for the past few years. They have not hit a positive uh, note on, 
on on their growth at all. They've been losing money. I think last year, let's see, let's look it up real quick. It's actually an interesting point that you bring up about them not being on the top. Five percent. They lost two point thirteen billion dollars last year. That's a lot of money. This year's not finished yet. We're we're coming up to the end of the the fiscal year and we'll get their their last quarter sales. Uh but it looks like last quarter they were down four percent. So yeah. It, it's p- possible that they're they're doing this. They're whether it's to penalize the gamers or they're trying to garner revenue not only to maintain their place or reclaim it, they might be looking to make an acquisition of their own and they're trying to get the funds to do that. I mean, right now it's an acquisition war. It's it's somewhat quiet at the same time, not quiet. It just happens and everyone nods their heads like, okay, cool. Yeah, it's another day. But right now you've got Tencent, who is the silent juggernaut. Everyone else is unaware of Tencent, even among gamers. They have no idea how much of a juggernaut Tencent is, how much of a threat Tencent could be, even to the Western gaming industry. So Tencent is a silent juggernaut dominating games that are very commonly played globally. You've got Microsoft, who's a, a public juggernaut. They, in typical American fashion, have no problem flaunting their wallet. And they're trying to scoop up as many of these developers as they can because they want a huge punt. They want a huge portion of that gaming pie. They want to be on the level of Tencent, basically. Sony has been forced into a corner to make their own moves, which wound up with them having a lawsuit for once again. Uh, which is funny that Ubisoft, was, with what they're doing, could potentially, at least I would think, win that raise red flags with gamers the same way it's, it did with Sony, because it's almost the same thing. I think they're playing with a double edged sword right now. Um, Of course I say that, but you know, let's back up for a second. Do I think Ubisoft is going anywhere? No, I don't think they're in trouble financially whatsoever. Uh, But I I think that all of this is going to come back and shoot them in the foot. All of it. I I think they're going to try it. And they're, I think they're going to see we're on the verge of a recession. We could, we could, you know, depending on where your resources are, are from but recession and no recession whatever we all feel individually there's no denying that outside gas going down a little bit which is nice the rest of the world prices are still going up and surging and we have some ups and downs but overall shit's getting a little tight out there yeah they got some dude ubisoft has seriously has a set of balls on them to increase their games to 70 dollars while while everybody's already struggling for one well, don't, just digital content versus hard copies aside. And don't forget, I said before, and, 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 and Yuli was a part of this conversation. I said, we believe that they're trying to make gaming a rich person, exclusive thing down the road. And with all these price increases, because they're already trying to remove the collective uh, monetary potential from gaming. At, realistically, it's already gone. It died pretty much with the, the PS3 era because anything pre PS3, there's tangible stuff. You go to a collector and you say, hey, I've got this Nintendo, Super Nintendo game instruction booklet unopened. They're going to gobble that up. How much do you want for it? Money made from your hobby which once again completely unravels everything people oh you can't make money from gaming and blah 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 so as time has gone on you've got to think you've got all these people that build these video game collections and who knows maybe developers and then the big investors get super upset well we sold this game for sixty dollars and then this guy 15 years down the road sells it for $60,000. Well, how is that fair to us? But they didn't make and create the game. But all we did was just move the merchandise around. And I think that's bothered them to the point that they've had to find a way to remove a monetary gain for gamers. The whole goal is for us to spend money 
and not make the money from it. The only way when you think about it, the only way you can truly make money from video games now is by streaming, which is a wheel that they don't mind us being on because that connects to ad revenue. However, if I said, you know what, screw the streaming grind, it's not worth it, but I have 500 video games that I've collected, I've beaten 250 of them, I want to sell those 250, I'm probably never going to play them again, 100% of them, and I have physical tangible copies, I find a collector somewhere, and they're willing to buy those 250 copies for 500, and we've seen it, it's not even a stretch, we've seen articles, people with video game collections valued at millions of dollars. And I go and if you add it all up and says, OK, well, over your life, you spent for these 250 games, uh, it came out to 10 grand and I flip it and I come back with 100 K. My hobby made me money and I didn't have to make any of that stuff. All I had to do was buy it, hold it, play it maybe as little as possible. But I found it, it, it to a collector. It had value now. I don't have to go back. And it's weird because, you know, a lot of people don't see that, like the connection with video games and, and the normal nine to five. But there's a huge connection because look how many people have stopped their normal nine to five to become streamers and gamers. A lot of those streamers are also probably collectors. They stream, they make a little money, they flip their collection, they make even more money. They will have no reason to go back out there to do a normal nine to five. Gaming is an expensive hobby, yes, but it was still an affordable hobby to your average gamer. Parents buy their kids games, their kids at like 12, 15 years old, boom, become a big time streamer, making tons of money. They start their collection early. What le Think about it. What leg would you have to tell them to go out there and get a nine to five if they're making 16 times the amount you make in your nine to five? And, you know, it's interesting you bring that subject up. Take a wild guess at what you think the average gamer's age is. Uh, 25. That's what I thought too. Okay. I thought about like mid twenties is what I thought. Not necessarily 25, but, uh, since, since 2020, since we saw the, the surge of, uh, of streaming ultimately, right. Um, <clears throat> 65% in 2020, 65% of Americans played video games and they define that by somebody who plays on average one hour a day on at least one platform. Now that doesn't necessarily they mean they play every day. That's just the average weekly of what they play. Mm. So you could say seven hours a week is what I, personally is what I would call that. But now re, the, the, the sor sources might give you slightly deviated numbers. Uh, but I looked at a couple earlier, just Googling it. Um, and approximately now 2022, 73% of Americans play gamers on at least one platform for approximately one hour a day. So as far as males go, males make up just over 50% of gamers. Females make up 43%. Again, resources are going to vary slightly. People mm. don't, don't go nuts because I was off 2%. Uh, the average gamers age 33 years old, the average gamer. Okay has been playing for approximately 14 years. That means we are the backbone. I say that because I'm 34 people. So suck it. I'm 34. <laughs> you could say, like I would say, I would say we are the backbone of gaming. We were there yeah. kind of when it, when it, you know, the consoles exploded in the late eighties, early nineties, mid nineties. Uh, and then we have a you know, new generation coming, you know, after us, and being innovative and taking it to places that we never thought we'd see it. So naturally these gaming industries are going to try to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And we've let them, mm -hmm. we've let them with these DLCs. We've let them purchasing by purchasing, not the base game, but pur purchasing the $80 version of the game that, you know, was $90 and gave us a few extra things. Uh, we made excuses to spend a little extra money to get all these things we love. And now after a pro about 10 years, I agree with that, that statement, the past 10 years or so, uh, cause we've seen a lot change for the past 10 years and an insane amount of things change. All of that stuff's coming to shoot us in the foot. And now with you, Ubisoft being a, a good example, they don't know what to do next. 
there was a lot of double edged swords going around and the, the the issues coming up with again digital versus hard copies uh and increasing uh prices to $70 these are these are double edged swords that we're seeing on their part and they don't know what to do next what's the next step with gamers Another thing that, um, as you were talking, I, I just thought about and, and the double edged sword, Ubisoft is also doing this almost on the heels of Sony winning one of their their lawsuits about overcharging gamers. Uh, because the thing was that they had to be proven to have a, a monopoly. It was proven they don't have a monopoly. And basically what happened is now, like you said, we're the backbone. It's too late. We're noticing and trying to do something too late. And the reason we are saying something now is because now we're the parents. We're entering that older generation where before we used to go to mom, we used to go to dad and we used to be like, come on, I just want one game. And they were like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. That's a lot of money. And I'm sure other gaming parents out there like myself are doing the same thing I'm doing. I'm not spending $60 (laughs) so you can buy a game in nine skins. I'm not buying those skins for you. You know, I'm not. You can fucking go earn those skins. I don't buy skins. No hate to anyone who does. What I'm saying is I'm not giving my money to an industry that keeps trying to find ways to take advantage of us. Yep. That's all I'm saying. And it sucks because we were slowly being programmed. And now that they're making these changes to program the new generation we are now seeing the problems that our parents before saw with us that we didn't see as a big deal. And now the industry, since it evolves with the times, they just weather the storm. They literally roll the die and see what happens. And when it's too soon, when the backlash is too fierce, they pick them back up and they say, we'll just wait a little bit, give it another couple of years and then do it again. And that's exactly what's happening. Except Ubisoft, Ubisoft, like you said, they've got some balls on them. As soon as they saw Sony one, they said, this is our moment. Let's go. Bam. And I promise you, if the gamers decide to have a backlash, Ubisoft will probably use Sony as the perfect defense to why they can charge these prices. Because if you read the article, they didn't justify or nor explain why. They just said, this is what we're doing. Some of our other games won't be this price, but our AAA titles will be. And it's like, it, it's kind of like they knew they were going to get backlash for removing the games. And now that we fought to get the games there, keep them, they're going to use, well, the server space needs to be uh, maintained and we got to pay people for that. That's the perfect excuse. That's the only excuse they would need because your average gamer is not going to comprehend beyond that. They're going to be like, oh yeah, you know what? That makes sense. These guys need to get paid. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what have you been doing for years? And uh, now suddenly it's a problem. So, you, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that is even more insulting is not only are they increasing their game prices, but all these systems, all the platforms have recently come out with, with tiers yeah. And each tier allows you different, uh, um, different, a- different levels of access to playing uh, original classics from back in the day. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously online gaming, uh, just different versions of those things, and how much of that stuff do you want? Um, so it's like we're constantly being asked to to shell out more and more and more money to do the same thing we've always done, and not, you know, for for those of us who don't go and spend or can't spend, you know a ton of money each month on gaming and can only buy, you know, a game or so uh, once a month or whatever. It's that's a lot of money that yeah. these companies keep asking us to show out. Like, where's the fucking line? And they, and the tiers seem more appealing to your average consumer because just like streaming services, it's like, Oh, that's 10 bucks a month. That's easy day. And I get access to thousands and thousands of games, but it's, it's basically like a long-term rental that, 10 bucks yeah. a month, it eventually adds up. You could have bought, on average, they give you access to thousands and thousands of games. Your average person is not going to play half of that library. They're going to play the one game that appeals to them. So in hindsight, you spent 
$10 to play on average one whole game. Even if you add up all the time, you say, well, I downloaded this one, this one, this one, and this one. I've got all access until uh, my subscription ends. So I got all these games I can play whenever. How many of them have you actually played, though? Because I know I downloaded a few and I still have only played one, maybe two. And I was like, man, maybe I should play some of these because I'm already paying for it. So in turn, it's basically like if you went to the store and you went and said, hey, I want to rent this game indefinitely. And they basically are like, OK, cool. You can rent any of the games here. We'll just charge you a dollar a day or technically if it's, you know, depending on whatever setup you have. We'll charge you five cents a day. It sounds like a steal. What? I can just come in here for five cents a day and, and rent a game off the shelf. Cool. You go, you rent the game, you play that game for about an hour, two hours. Then you get a busy week. You might be in college. You might work. You might be married. You probably got kids. So now your game time is cut, but you still are paying that five cents a day compared to when you went and you said, I want this game. Here's my money. Now this game is mine. It's a done deal. Five cents a day is extremely generous considering <laughs> it's a pro, you know, it's about 15 to $30 a month a for month. Uh, any average. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to break it down to like the service. smaller numbers in case somebody yeah. was trying to sit there and be like, well, I was like, you're back. being real generous, I'm being right real now, generous. five cents. Yeah. But basically they're using us like a stock market and we're what seems like a steal to us is us constantly paying an investment on something we are not consistently using even streamers probably yeah even if they stream play a game eight hours a day they're usually playing one game for that eight hours at a time so they're not even playing half the library even if they're doing monthly subscriptions and here's another thing and i, I cannot stress this enough to listeners do remember not all i'm not saying all i'm usually talking about the really really big ones they get their money back they're sponsored. <laughs> so they're getting paid. So the money is nothing to them. They drop 30 bucks. They get like 30,000 back or they probably have free subscriptions to these things. But for you, the stuff eventually starts to add up. for you. For me, it starts to add up. And that's the whole goal. Yeah. Hundreds of games, your favorite games. OK, but what if my favorite game is coming off the list tomorrow? There's nothing I can do about it. Now you're rushing me to play a game. So maybe only 100 people play that game, but this is what we have. We, we, we want to play that game. Why do we have to suffer? Because you no longer want to supply that game. Well, now I don't want to supply you my money. <laughs> like, they're, they're taking half of what made gaming, like, in my opinion, uh, amazing. And they're trying to make it this, like, super exclusive club thing. Is it in its best form with these ever evolving worlds and how wide it's spread and that it's a bigger community and now people are accepting of it? That is amazing. That is excellent. Gaming wouldn't have come as far probably if it wasn't for COVID. Um, so that's the, great. The next, the next step, and, and I say the next step, but I, I vividly remember this being a topic of concern uh, at least a year ago. Because I remember hearing about it. It was brief, and then it went away, and we all forgot about it. Uh, Microsoft talked about doing this on the Xbox, but platforms showing ads, ads. in the screen while like not even necessarily of gaming, just ads in general, uh, and then you can uh, pay, pay to not have the ads. It's coming. I mean, they've already been in games, but they were non and non intrusive. Like yeah, in racing, it, it was games. more like a, a recommendation slide. Exactly. It playing. It was an ad that was playing off like a recommendation slide. I'm gonna tell you if I'm playing paying for a tier of anything, and I don't want anyone to think that I do, I have a PlayStation tier. I will be one of the first to admit. Yes, I do have a PlayStation tier uh, because I was able to roll over my credit, and I said, you know what, let me give it a try. In theory, it looks great. It's amazing. I can download almost any game I want. But already, I'm like two months into my tier, and I've only played like two of those games. But if I'm starting to play a game and I swear I start seeing ads pop up in the corner where they start becoming like YouTube and Twitch word, like annoying ads. I'm done. I am so done. You know, one of the, one of the things I think that that's the purpose of the uh, tier system is, is to see which of the classics are worth the time and money for these 
companies to reboot or remake uh, for modern day. They'll see how many people download and play certain classic games that haven't been around for, you know, at least 10 years. Maybe the last version of it was in the 90s, whatever the case is, kind of like Final Fantasy VII. Uh, and they'll see and they'll go, OK, X amount of people play this game and they're willing to pay a tier for this now is will we make more money by having them continuously pay every month? Or does it seem like in our benefit to, you know, remake this game and sell it? And then we'll just remove the classic and force them all to play the new version. Probably. So if that happens X amount of time from now, you heard it here. You heard it here. Predicted here. Predicted. So, but and honestly, maybe I shouldn't be predicting stuff because most of the time when we bring something up and we're like, this is probably what they're doing. This is probably their aim or their angle. A few months later, we hear some bullshit and we're like, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they're probably like, oh, well, since they already know, let's just let's just accelerate it. I swear to God, they're listening to us. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Just you need to start paying us if you're listening. Um, but anyway, guys, let us know your thoughts. What do you think about this? Is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Are you seeing connections that we don't have? Uh, you can send us a voice clip. And we will go through them and we'll pick some uh, from among the selection. Warners will go and select some of the voice clips uh, with your guys' feedback. Uh, you can go to osn-media.com, go to the show's page, make sure you click on the GZ Chop Shop podcast. And right at the top of the page, you can submit a voice or text and we will review them. We would love to know your guys' thoughts. If you're in the industry, if you just have an opinion or you just want to say, hey, uh, I think you guys are real big on your conspiracy theories, but you're awesome. So submit your voice clips. Uh, we definitely want to hear your feedback on that. <sighs> now we're going to move on. What's up, GZ Chop Shop fans? Project Itachi here. Have you checked out our store, thegzshop.com? If not, and you're definitely missing out. We have apparel for men and women that's both comfortable and stylish. New arrivals every month. Curious? Visit the GZShop.com after the show and use promo code CHOPSHOP22 to get 10% off your order. We'll thank us later. That is right, uh, Chop Shop fans. If you like my, uh, if you're watching on YouTube or you see this in a highlight and you see this only gaming t-shirt I'm rocking, you can get this right now in our store. Brand new. It's actually very, very comfortable. And I, I love the the color. I usually like to do like black shirts, but this gray one and, and the, the text, it all comes together. It's really, really nice. And we got a whole bunch of different colors, a whole bunch of different logos and stuff. So make sure you go visit that store. Check it out after the episode. Really appreciate it. Now, moving on. Recently, we had D23. For anyone who doesn't know, this is basically Disney Showcase where they showcase games and shows. And it's a big thing. Everyone has a showcase now. <laughs> if you didn't know, everybody has a showcase now. Um, and I don't want to focus so much on what Disney Showcase because they did showcase a lot. And you guys can easily find that information. You just Google D23. They, they cover a lot. I just want to kind of focus on the Marvel cow. And I call it the Marvel cow because honestly, for like the last, I want to say five years, maybe less, they've been leaning in really hard on Marvel. I mean, like really hard with games and the TV shows and movie, which don't do not get me wrong. I thoroughly enjoy what they're putting out. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think some of the luster of the MCU was the waiting game in between that hype that could be built because it used to be year, a year between films. At least it was like you got the film and then you had to wait a year and all you had to tide you over was that end credit scene. And then it was a year of like speculation and building up. But now it's like. Even when you look on social media, you see people, it's like the movie comes out and they're like, all right, the next one, like six months, right? And it's like, what? And it's like, uh, where's our movie? Where's our show? Yeah, it's definitely every time you look up at the theater, every, every couple, three or four months, there's a Marvel movie up there. 
it's gotten to the point I can't even keep up. Well, I think, you know, initially when we were uh, building up with in-game, it was new. None of us had really experienced a, a, a combined world like that. Yeah. Uh, Iron Man was so huge when it first came out. And not yeah. only that, but that was Robert Downey Jr. is like his biggest role in, in so long. I think it was, it was, like it was a comeback a, 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 role for him. Yeah, on his big yeah. comeback. So, you know, fans were going to see that Marvel or not just because they loved Robert Downey Jr. Uh, we get up to Endgame and then, you know, it finally happens. The, 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 the big ending. It's all done, right? Well, then we have some sequels of kind of what, what's the rest of the Avengers doing, uh, kind of ending their, their story after Thanos, right? Yeah. And, and that was pretty, that, that was hype. That was cool. That was interesting to see like where everybody kind of, you know, ended up and what their continued story was. Uh, how did it come to an end? But now it's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to make a whole new situation? Or are you just going to keep trying to branch off all the original stuff that was honestly really good for what it was and, and when it came out? I mean, they're already pushing. They're they running out of steam. Adventure films named and ready to go. They're, like, they're running out of steam. And I'm not saying that that they're not going to make money or that it's not worth it. And I'm not saying that most of them are bad. But the quality is going down. The writing is decreasing. Um and just like anything, right, if we all get enough of it, those, you know, the dopamine levels start kind of uh, leveling off. Yeah. It, so it's what the question here is, what, why would I keep watching Marvel movies versus in my case and, and a lot of uh, you know, uh, people like me who read comics and watch anime, stuff like that. Why wouldn't I just keep reading the comics? The comics have not only do they have plenty of things for me to read, but the writing for the most part is really good. Mm hmm. And there's, I, there's no running out and everything's right there. And it's, it's not Disney. It's more intense. It's more adult. It's fun. And I think a lot of people uh, that have recognized and learned and gotten into these comics because of the, the Disney making these Marvel movies, I think we're going to see a lot of people same thing, even if they didn't read comics before. Now they are. Now they're realizing, Oh wow, there's like all this great stuff out here. And it's going to add to that loss of steam for these movies. Yeah. Because it's almost like now it's just on a schedule. It's just, okay. It's like, it's almost like on that call of duty schedule. You can almost set your clock by it. Oh, it's May time for a Marvel movie. Oh, it's July time for another Marvel movie. When, I mean, it was like towards the end of phase four that we started getting that twice a year. But before it was one a year. And then in one year we had Multiverse of Madness and Thor Love and Thunder. You know what I want to see? There's always a conspiracy theorist situation with you know most of the things that go on in the world. I maybe they're there. If they're there, guys, let us know. I want to know because I fun fact, people, I love conspiracy theories, no matter how bad they are, no matter how obviously stupid and ridiculous. <laughs> are, they're just fun to indulge in. Like, ah, yeah. look, this is ridiculous. I'm the same way with like cryptids and aliens, like whether or not they exist. I, who am I to say, but it's interesting to watch the guy that lives in the woods talk about what he thinks he saw. Cause he was really drunk. <laughs> I like that stuff. It's interesting to me. I want to see the guy come out of the woodworks and like, they're just trying to, to distract us from the wars and the aliens with all these Marvel movies, they're just keeping our attention. That's why they're on a schedule. Like I want, there's gotta be someone out there who you know? is like, like they're yeah. just distracting us with Marvel. I could totally see that too. I could totally see that. Like Disney's being paid by the government to roll out <laughs> Marvel to movies to keep us distracted and like, eh, just keep them busy. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> A lot of times the conspiracy theories are more exciting than the actual thing that they're talking about. You know, like the, the their thoughts are just like, like what? So, yeah, if you guys know of any uh, Marvel conspiracy theorists who think we're being distracted, I'd, I'd love that. That's real specific, I think. But yeah. there's always a couple out there. I want to know if they exist. And and then <clears throat> on the flip side with uh, which, like I said, they went all in on Marvel. And I'm like. I know you guys have been screwing it up, but I mean, it's a big universe. You guys can do a little bit more with Star Wars. Like, I know you're throwing some 
they're throwing a few Chrome shows out there. They're throwing a little something. Oh, we got Mandalorian the- season three. We got a new series coming out. Okay. But the movies, <laughs> can we get some of that? Like I'm almost marveled out. Like I, let me tell you how marveled out I am. Thor. I went, saw multiverse of madness. I took my mom to see it as a mother's day, uh, gift. We went out, we saw it, we, we enjoyed it. And at the end with the, you know, that bad CGI of an eye, I was like, okay, Marvel or Disney, whomever you, you, you're losing your, your edge here. You're so busy putting the money in the shows. Even your movies are starting to show a little, getting a little sloppy. Like it was bad enough that my mom noticed that was bad CGI. And I'm like, that's saying something. And Thor Love and Thunder came out. And it was not even anything against the Thor. I like the Thor movies. Even with what anyone else says, I will still watch a movie for myself. Thor Love and Thunder came out. And I was like, uh, I can wait. Disney Plus will have it in like a couple months. And sure enough, I forgot about the movie. And now it's on Disney Plus. And now I can just turn it on and watch it. The excitement to go to the theater to watch the movies is gone for me. You know, I, I was reading something about Chris Hemsworth recently regarding uh, Thor love and thunder. And I'm paraphrasing people. Okay. But basically he was saying he didn't want to do Th- Thor four because uh, Ragnarok was so good and it was different. It was exciting. And it, it's honestly, it's my favorite Thor movie. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. Uh, two is pretty like, you know, it was all right. Uh, but his concern was that four would just flop that it would, not be something fun and exciting and he didn't want to be he didn't want to do anything anymore if it wasn't going to be fun or exciting for the fans which i think is cool when when you know that a a particular actor uh wants to do a good job for the fans Mm -hmm. um and i think i I haven't watched love and thunder yet i just haven't gotten around to it i certainly you you can definitely tell where the steam's running out because someone like me who, who loves all these different things I didn't go to the theater to watch it. I was like, I'll just wait till it's on Netflix or something, or I'll just rent it when I can rent it. But I, I didn't yeah. like run to the theater and I, and I know a lot of people like that. And uh, I know it didn't do as well as they hoped it did. I'm not saying the movie was bad. I'm just saying it didn't do as well as uh, they could they have, if they had just not done it, <laughs> just left it alone, which like huge props to yeah. the actors and actresses that, because I heard Christian Bale, he did a phenomenal job. And, you know, like I said, I, hey, I heard the same. Um, which is another thing I do want to touch on. And and I was starting to see this trend start even towards the end of phase four. And I was like, Marvel's becoming this big cameo joke, even to the point that she Hulk itself makes a joke about the cameos in the movies. And it's not so much the cameos of their own universe, but the cameos of big name actors and actresses that are popping up in Marvel movies now. Because Marvel is like the standard. It's like once you're in a Marvel movie, everyone suddenly knows you. And I kind of get it because there might be a big draw. But I also feel it kills the potential for some younger actors to roll into these roles. Because the actors they have right now, on average, they're in their 40s. And these movies take like four to five years to make. And they already have other commitments. I mean, what, Paul Rudd's in his 50s? How much longer is he going to play Ant-Man? I mean, he doesn't look like he's in the 50s, but like, you know, they're they're in their 40s. So they're going to be trying to find roles where they can wind down a little bit. And these movies want to ramp up the action. And they pick these actors, um, they, the big the big A-listers. Well, for the most part, they were in their prime. But at the same time, like I said, they're, 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 they're going to age out. And then it's... I feel like it's hard now because I feel they, they kind of do it with some of the shows, but at the same time, I'm like, this is a chance for new actors to hit the scene. People who need those breaks that I think we perfect example. No one really knew who Hugh Jackman was until he got the role of Wolverine for the longest time. There was so many people like this person would be a great Wolverine. This person would be a great Wolverine. This person would be a great Wolverine. And then Hugh Jackman came in and everyone was like, he's Wolverine. But nobody knew who he was before then. If I say Kate and Leopold, half of the people would not know what I'm talking about, except the ladies. The ladies who probably knew who Hugh Jackman was probably know about the movie Kate and Leopold. Yes, I know about the movie Kate and Leopold. Really good movie. That's all I'll say. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Nobody knew who he was until he was given a chance. And it was Russell Crowe 
who got him that chance. And this is why I say I feel unnamed actors and actresses would probably be able to bring back that spark. Yes, we had Robert Downey Jr. that kicked it off and got everything going. And then they were just like, let's just keep bringing in big names. Let's just keep bringing in big names. Because. Well, remember, his, he, he was a big name. He was already I a mean, big name. He hadn't been in movies in a long time, you know, with his history with you know drug use and, and getting in trouble and stuff. He had fallen off the radar. So that was his. I, I agree with you, but also that was that was a huge comeback for him. That was yeah, for and him, it for him to be able to get that role that he people had to he fit the role. Like I don't remember names, but I just remember reading that people had to talk uh, the powers that be into getting him that role and letting him have it. Yeah, I think I people th- were there were people that were very insistent that he got that role. I and think there was a lot of pushback. I might be wrong, but I think Terrence Howard also vouched for him. That sounds right. That I that uh, vaguely my memory is you know, fuzzy on details, but I just know yeah. that the situation was people had to like, they really pushed hard for him to get that. And, role. and he, and you know, cause there it, were a lot of studios and, and, and directors and stuff that still wanted nothing to do with him. Yeah. Which he killed the role. I'm glad. I'm very glad he got it. He killed it. And, and talking about bringing unnamed actors into mainstream roles to give them a, a chat. Well, and, and I'm not saying he's unnamed. I didn't know who Benedict Cumberbatch was before star Trek into darkness. And Star Trek Into Darkness was 2012, I think. The original yeah, one came out 2009. A, a massive mm-hmm. Doctor Who fan. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I knew who he was portraying. I was like, this guy's going to be Khan. Oh, no. OG Khan is going to be the Khan. And then I got to see him and I was like, you know what? I like it. Yeah, they, they did a little tweak it to his voice, but he already had a nice voice for the role and i'm like i like this guy then i started watching him in other and th- other and i can't other other stuff i started watching him in other stuff and i watched him in sherlock and i was like holy crap this guy has some range and then when i saw he was dr strange i was like yes but you know Sp- speaking on the topic of of you know running out of steam and stuff i will my my opinion not everyone is going to agree with me on this and that's that's <coughs> completely fine uh since uh since the end of the original Avengers, right? Mm-hmm. And everything started kind of branching out into like sub stories and continuations. Uh, Multiverse of Madness, hands down, my opinion, the best Marvel movie to come out since the Avengers Endgame. I say that because, and maybe it's may, maybe close second to uh, Ragnarok, maybe. They did, they had, Disney had some balls on them to do what they did in that, in that movie. And I know, uh, I I remember reading that they had to tone it down a lot, believe it or not. And they had a lot of stuff removed because, uh, Disney's concern was that it was too dark. I mean, it was pretty dark for Disney in in Disney's on Disney's terms. Anyways, uh, that movie didn't do very well at the box office. It did. Okay. It'll probably get a sequel just because it's a Marvel movie and Disney has fuck you money. um, and it didn't do as well. And I feel like the main reason behind that uh, was because uh, half the people that go and see these movies um, that have children, they brought their children to see it and they didn't realize like they, they didn't know anything about how dark that version <clears throat> of um, uh, the, the multi, the multiverse of madness and Dr. Strange. They didn't know this stuff the way some of us might've seen the previews and saw the multiverse of madness and been like, Oh, Oh, I know what this is. I know what direction we're going. Yeah. So, you know, I think half the people got even more excited because it was different. It was way different than any Marvel movie. Yeah. A hundred percent. It should have done better, but unfortunately people were bringing their children to see this movie and getting upset. Yeah. I, I guess people don't know how to read spoiler free reviews and, do their research. Like I see no problem with, I think my mom used to do it. She would see a movie without me first. She would go see it. She would leave me my grandparents. She would go see the movie. <clears throat> and then if she saw that it was good for me, then she would tell me we were going to go see a movie and then we would go see the movie. It didn't ruin it for me. Cause I didn't know that she had seen it already. <laughs> so 
you know, if she brought me with it, she enjoyed it for this. She enjoyed me enjoying it. And, you know, I think a, a lot of, you know, a lot of parents, they just go like Disney and, you know, they don't realize, yeah, that's Disney's been trying to wean themselves away from being just known as that for like the last few years. Like we have to accept the fact that they do so much more now. That's why we're seeing a lot of their shows get a little bit more mature, a little a little bit more violence in them, a little bit more language in them. They're trying to be they're trying to drop those hints like, look, here's for the kids, but here's for the adults. You got to know when to separate them. But yeah, um, I do feel like Disney is is really, really, really straining that cow. And it wouldn't hurt to let up on it a little bit. But once again, guys, let us know your thoughts, views, opinion. Do you think it's enough Marvel? Like, would it, could they take a break or is it not enough Marvel? How do you feel, guys? How do you feel? <laughs> How do you guys feel about it? Let us know in the comments. Let us know on the website. Send us a, a voice clip. We would love to hear from you guys your thoughts on this. Um, but going into the last thing and, and pretty much really, really brief, uh, the Nintendo Direct was today um and for you guys it'll actually be uh this past tuesday it happened but um we we saw the nintendo direct and it's a it was a pretty good one everyone finally got what they've wanted for like the last two years and it's an official release date for the legend of zelda breath of the wild uh sequel which is now the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom it looks beautiful too. It's it looks unfinished, beautiful. and I even put a little thing there that like it doesn't like. Yeah, this is not what the final product is going to be, uh, but it looks gorgeous. It looks it looks really really good. Um, it's been in development. I, I want to say it's been in development hell. Like you know, a lot of people probably don't want to say it has been, but I think it's been in development hell for the last few years. Um, and it's kind of good. I, I can't imagine the pressure though, being on the team that works on any Zelda game. After because Breath of the Wild, there, well, just period, man. I mean, every single legend, the Legend of Zelda game that has ever come out has done well. None of them suck. Now there are a handful that you know maybe we don't like as much, or they're yeah. our least favorite. That's of course, but none of them suck, and none of them certainly hurt them. So to keep that standard of these Zelda games, I can't imagine the pressure. And they probably have been watching gamers over the last few years, what we like, what we don't like. And they probably had to, they've added things probably that they had to take out because they thought it was cool. And the gamers like, oh, that's so drab. And they're like, all right, well, we can't use that. And they've had to try to stay fresh and probably ahead of the curve in all areas. That goes to show you the kind of work and dedication that goes into actually making a story driven First player game that's finished upon release. Yeah. No DLCs, no expansions. And it's it's last of its kind as far as these types of games go. Now, Breath of the Wild did have expansions. However, I will give them leeway on the expansion because Breath of the Wild itself was a completed game. Exactly. There, there was no there was no serious issues. There was no, you know, no problems you didn't require you didn't have to wait on the dlc yeah to can for the continuation exactly like the game was done yeah. you played the game and it was done but you didn't need the dlcs yeah to continue enjoying the storyline yeah you can play breath of the wild it gave you subsets of the storyline but it wasn't like you have to play those to enjoy the next game we're going to come out with yeah <clears throat> you can you can play Breath of the Wild beginning to end a hundred times over without ever once getting DLC. You you don't miss anything. It's just added features that just expand on what was already an expansive world, and that's basically all we ask for. Yeah, that's all we ask for. Give us a completed game to enjoy, and then let that. DLC literally be optional, not make me feel like I'm missing out on, on an experience. May 12th, 2023. I don't, I haven't heard about the, the release date in a while for a Nintendo switch Two. but I was under the impression that that was something that was going to be coming out the next year or two. It wouldn't surprise me if 
that might be a big hint to when it's coming out <clears throat> because I don't think there's ever been a Nintendo console that's launched without not, a, a Zelda special edition. Right. And n- not to say that the switch needs a sequel at all. The switch is a 10 out of 10 by itself. It, it needs no, you know, upgrades at, at this current time. Um, I'm, I'm just speaking from like what we, what we typically expect and see from platforms releasing new, new models. Yeah. So, um, but for me, definitely excited about Zelda Octopath Traveler two was announced. That's something a lot of people have been fire emblem, fire emblem engage looks good. I, you know, a lot of, I've talked to a lot of people. I've gotten mixed results in conversation about people that whether or not they like fire emblem kind of seems hit or miss, but the people who do like it are people who grew up with game boys, game boy advanced, the 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 2d 3d the ds like all all those they all had there's so many damn fire emblem games and those those fire emblem games kept me going when i didn't have pokemon i was playing fire emblem man i'm gonna tell you next year i'm always excited for a new new entry of of smash bro characters they're gonna come out with another space if they don't announce a new smash bros we're about to see another expansion to the roster after that fire emblem drops. I was going to say, I, I wouldn't doubt it if they started adding anime characters, uh, but that probably would change. I the whole say that, but th- that's, that's <clears throat> what Pokemon technically is. Yeah. Is, is anime. So and, read the manga people. And speaking of guess, this, this wasn't at direct. I actually just found this in passing. Uh, I'm going to start getting in the, console collecting especially since games are losing their trade value i'm like well i guess i'll collect consoles when i can get them uh specifically nintendo anyone who's a big pokemon fan the pokemon scarlet and violet nintendo switch will launch uh early november before the game launch so if you guys are huge on those console collections keep your eyes open early november i think it's like november 14th or just before then, because the game comes out the 18th, uh, you can get the collector edition uh, Nintendo Switch for that as well. Also, I want you guys to, ending on this thought. Nintendo, if the game norms of prices change, doing a full circle real quick, Nintendo will be the cheapest in the bunch because they've been almost consistently $60 since like the early 2000s. Think about that. Yep. Yep. They went from being almost the most expensive to now they're going to probably be the cheapest. But by the way, Golden Eye. Oh, out. yeah. Remastered. People, it's not a, it's not a remake. They just touched it up a little bit and then they reformatted it to fit our TVs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <See what I> <laughs> That's my bad joke. Dad joke of the day. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I kind of wondered why. If why wouldn't it just be part of the tiers? But it kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier. If they can sell a game and feel like they'll make more selling the game than yep. they would people paying a tier to play the game, yep, then they'll do it. And it's my fucking point right there. Yep, because they know how beloved GoldenEye is. People have been begging for years for them to bring that back since the GameCube. I'm curious how it's going to do though. And it's not because I'm, I'm concerned like it's a bad game. It's, it's, it's an old game. It's a nineties game. It's, it's very old, but the people that can vouch for this game and, and the hows and why is it so great are us, our generation. We grew up on that game. Uh, I'm curious to see how the new generations of gamers enjoy this game. I don't Will think they they're going to have a problem. I don't think, there's going to be a problem. <clears throat> I think if anything, they're banking on us selling it to the new generation. Cause the new generation yeah. are our kids. You want to share an experience with them that introduced you to gaming. And they brought back split screen of something that the new generation almost has no idea about that literally set the standard for multiplayer gaming. <clears throat> I mean, think how awesome for you as a father, you get GoldenEye on the Switch, and then you and your son and your daughter can all sit down and you show them how it all started. You think you think Fortnite's it? This is where Fortnite started. <laughs> and in the room, have that experience. I'll be sure to tell everyone in my family that there are no skins, only death awaits you as you 
go against me. If you think for a second I'm ever going to go easy on my kids, and not just gaming on anything, but I'm going to... It's oh, their move. They, they make they sure that they don't... It's, it's, well, no, it's a wrap. There is a skin, technically, the biggest hacked character in GoldenEye, because he was shorter than everyone else. Oh, that's right. That's right. I will say this, though, and you guys heard it here. I'm, I'm admitting it fully. My, my son, who is uh, nine years old now, beat my ass in Smash Brothers. Like, it wasn't even close. And I wasn't, I didn't have it in me to demand a rematch just to get my ass whooped like that again. I had never been so pissed off at another human being much less a nine-year-old but equally proud the gamer was pissed off the papa was proud <laughs> yeah <laughs> like dude it, but he asked me to keep playing after that a couple more rounds since i'm it just never ended well i got which you know like i don't play it all the time mm-hmm. but like most seasoned gamers you can pick up virtually any game you get the buttons down right or you remember them because it's been a little bit easy day you're just right back where you started I don't know if I was that rusty or if he was just that good, but either I just got mowed, man. I got deleted so quick. It was just you, embarrassing. You need to play with me and burn. You want to, you want to get that skill back. I might just have my burn. son play you guys. Cause I'm gonna be honest. If my son whoops both y'all's asses, I'm going to ask him if he wants to do some tournament turn tournaments. That would be you fair because you want to do some tournaments. You if you can whoop these two burn much less burn. If Y'all don't know Burn. He's he's a colleague of ours on this show. He's in he's stupid good at fighting games. His thing is fighting games. He lives and breathes fighting games. He won. I would never a tournament in Japan. Japan. I personally, of all fighting games, I'm personally I I know I'm really good at Dragon Ball games. Every time one comes out, I play the shit out of it, and it's always the same. Like I'm just dominating. I'm really good at these games. Mortal Kombat and the rest of them, not so much. <laughs> Burn, I would never ask to, to like fight this guy in Dragon Ball. The one fighting game I'm really good at. I knew I had I had I had fucked up one day when he and I I flew out to Texas to visit him and the family, and we were playing a game that he introduced me to. And I've learned the basics of most fighting games. They all have a certain basics. Once I usually get the basics down, I'm good. Now, I never brag when I win. I learned my lesson a long time ago. Never brag when you win, because as far as you know, that person was containing their power level. But with Burn, there was a 2D game that he loved. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. I think it was Under the Night. And I happened to beat him in a whole match. Mind you, he was sitting back. I was sitting forward. Like, I get into it because I'm like, I got it, you know. And I knew I messed up when I beat him. And I was like, oh, man, that was a hard fought victory. And he was like, oh, run that back. And he was sitting back. And then he sat forward and put like he sat forward. And I was like, oh, no, (laughs) please. No, And it went downhill for me from there. But yeah, uh, yeah. If your son beats Burn, then yeah, you need to set him up for some tournaments. One hundred percent. Um, can't imagine. So yeah, closing out uh, our our last segment, um, our anime picks of the week. And I got to say, I the one I have this week, I found by chance on Amazon Prime of all places, um, and. I know you guys are probably expecting me to come and say like some shonen or some action thing because usually that's like the trend and it's like probably expected of a guy. But this one's actually a love romance. And I I I was looking for something off the beaten path that I typically would have glazed over. And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna click, 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 find something. And what caught me was the subtitle of this anime, Love is Hard for an Otaku. But the name of the anime, my pick for this week is uh Watakoi, love is hard for an otaku. And for anyone who doesn't know what an otaku is, it's basically a person who is truly into either games, cosplay, anime, um, anything that normal society deems weird. Um, They're fully invested into it, like those super 
intense cosplayers that really get into it. Those hardcore gamers, they live and breathe games, the anime ma- manga readers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a romance co- uh, comedy of these two otakus and their relationship together and with their friends. And they all work together and they're all otakus. One of them is a hardcore gaming otaku. He lives and breathes games. The other one is a yaoi fanatic. She loves her yaoi manga. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to let y'all look that one up on your own. Um, her friend is a cosplaying and manga fanatic. She loves cosplaying and, and manga. And her boyfriend is really big into uh manga and like card captor sok- sakura um and watching the dynamic between these four friends is just pure hilarity it's like a it's a good slice of life it's it's no action and it's just their interactions with each other and it's funny because if you have any passion in any of these things games anime manga you can see yourself in these characters and i totally saw myself in these characters and then it made me think it, weirdly enough, it made me think about like as a person who has hobbies like these and how many times I've run into people who do not understand my hobbies, how it's just better to match with someone who's on that same wavelength and how much fun you could have with someone that understands and accepts those those your love of those hobbies and why you love them and how much more fun you could have with someone instead of because uh the the main female uh, protagonist, she would hide her otaku side from her boyfriends. She would like hide it, bury it, and those relationships failed. And then she finally got with an otaku guy, and the relationship like blossomed into this awesome thing that they didn't even expect and they didn't even realize. And it just it was like it was so heartwarming and it's so funny and it's just a great time. Uh, that I highly recommend it for anyone who's looking for something off their usual genre. And you, like I said, it's on Amazon prime. Check that anime out. I usually don't talk about like love romance animes, like a hundred percent pure love romance animes, but this one was so good. My only gripe, there's not another season. It ends on 11 episodes and I'm like, I need more. So I have to read it. It's amazing how much uh, <clears throat> of a story can be told in an anime in just 11 10 episodes, to, 10 to 15 episodes. Yeah. Such a good anime. Such a good anime. I highly, highly recommend it. You will not be disappointed. Check it out. Totally worth it. I might just rewatch it again because it was just that good. <laughs> well, uh, for me, uh, I'm going to recommend something for uh, some of the newer anime um enthusiasts uh the original blood anime movie i'm going to challenge anyone who might also think that anime is for kids watch the original blood it's called blood and it has a positive sign next to it blood anime it's it's a movie the original movie came out around 2000 i believe Mm -hmm. um Shortly after they released uh, Blood C and uh, a continuation of it, uh, you can the, watch them in orders. Who's the Who's the studio behind that? I, I the name is on the tip of my tongue, and I just can't. Ig and Anaplex. Anaplex. That's right, Anaplex, the same one affiliated with Demon Slayer. And that that universe is among actually, plenty of other things. That whole universe is also connected to. Uh, I think Subasa Reservoir Chronicles and yes, XX Holic. Yes, it is. Yep. I don't know about that one, but yeah. Um, I highly recommend it. And then uh, it, you're not going to find the... Now, there's a live action movie. Don't watch that one. It's uh, I, I don't advise anyone ever watching a live action anime movie. None of them are good. <laughs> so watch the anime movie, not the live action movie. Um, but it's intense, people. And then the... Um, the series, which you can find on uh, Funimation, Crunchyroll, or maybe both of them, but they're on one or the other. Uh, you can watch the continuation, which is a two-part, I think, two-series long. Um, 
and it's pretty good. It's kind of like a continuation of what happens after the fact. And the last iteration is pretty parts of the blood series is, is so intensely fucked up good but fucked up that countries it's on the list of animes that have been banned from certain countries especially china uh and some believe it or not uh and and some other asian countries so uh but it's a good it's a it's a to the point storyline it's it's decent okay don't go in there expecting you know attack on titan or any you know crazy storylines that get more and more no it's it's a pretty straightforward storyline uh but it's good and clamp and uh, for me it's a, it's a clo- it's an original of. what's that clamp is one of the other oh yeah studios behind uh the, the blood series yeah i think they did the uh season two the uh after everything happened but yeah I, blood i recommend it um watch it do not watch it around children <laughs> you will get in trouble <laughs> or you'll hate yourself one of the two fun fact don't watch any f- new anime around your kids you really shouldn't <laughs> just just to be on the safe side there's there's a handful of animes on netflix that i'm very surprised about now of course you know, like, granted like if you go to the like kids if you go to the kids netflix icon uh there's hardly any anime on there i, I think the anime stops at pretty much like pokemon Oh, stuff like that um but I am very surprised and I'm curious to how many parents might not realize this about anime and they're just out there like giving their kids free reign. But yeah, don't ever watch an anime you've never seen before Yeah, around people that maybe they don't, they don't know or understand because you find yourself in a situation. <laughs> mm-hmm. Very awkward. But that is everything we have for you guys for this week. Uh, we really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening. If you have any feedback, or any thoughts on anything we've covered this week, make sure to visit our website, osn-media.com. Visit the show page, GZ Chop Shop Podcast, and at the very top, you can submit your audio clip. Or if you don't want your voice played and you might be a little shy, you can also submit it via text, and we might read it on the show. We would love to hear from you guys, your thoughts, your opinions. If you're in the industry, check it out. And if you happen to be in any of the industries we cover, Check out our uh, Be A Guest page. Fill out the form, and we would love to connect with you guys to have you on the show. We would love to get some feedback from the industry um, because all we can do is be outsiders looking in and take the facts as they're presented on the Internet, which we know numbers get pushed, and then it's conspiracy and facts, and then you just get a mixed pot of things. So we would love to hear from anyone oh, in yeah. the industry. Please explain to me why $70. Yes, I, I we would love, love to know why you guys charge $70. If you please, work at Ubisoft, please, please let us know why you charge Put me in my place. I Please. <laughs> we would love to, we would love to appreciate that. Um, and if you guys love everything about the show, make sure to visit our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash OSN Media. If you want to get these episodes completely ad free, you want to hear your name shouted out on the show, if you want early access and if you want to be part of the new watch parties that we're going to be introducing to our discord server with all the perks included you can get all of that when you visit our patreon.com forward slash osn media along with promo codes that you can use in our store as well such as free shipping or huge huge discounts totally worth it go check it out it helps out the show and allows us to continue on our other podcasts as well gunpowder red and afterthoughts after dark Anyway, that is everything. You guys have been amazing. Stay safe. Take care of yourself and each other. And we will catch all you wonderful people on the next podcast.